You're listening to episode 109 of the D6 Podcast. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we wanna be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here's your hosts, Ron Hunter and Jeremy Lee. This is the family ministry podcast that helps you connect church and home. How are we doing today, Ron? We're doing well. Good. Absolutely. I, I'm Man, how about you? What's been going on in your world? Well, you and I just went out for lunch, and we had an amazing barbecue. We did. And, so, then, and then we had to make a stop along the way coming back to get you what? Some floss. Some because, floss. Because <laughs> you talked you. about my PC computer. I'm going to throw floss back on you. it. Yes, I did. I had to get some floss. There was a little bit of barbecue going and on And then I had there. to wipe my windshield when you were done picking your teeth. <laughs> no, well, no, know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We did have a good barbecue lunch, though. I hope my dentist hears this podcast. Because, I mean, that might be the only time in the world I've ever been caught flossing. That's impressive. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, Jeffrey Wallace. I've got no segue from flossing to Jeffrey <laughs> Wallace, so we're just going to roll. You know, to... it's rare that I can get you tongue-tied. I'm enjoying <laughs> this moment. But my man, Jeffrey Wallace, I mean, I think he should charge admission to be around him. He, <laughs> I mean, he is he's... contagious. Love this guy. Oh, yeah. You guys are going to love him as well. Now, the one thing about Jeffrey that people may not know, uh, if you haven't been around him recently, is he took over uh, the amazing SLU, Student Leadership University, I think is what that is. Um, it's a program that where they train student leaders on a on a whole nother level. I mean, I think it's uh, – they have a, probably all around, but I know they have one in Orlando where they mm-hmm. go through SeaWorld and they go through, right. meet all these CEOs and do these fabulous things. Well, Jeffrey's in charge of that now, um, and he is – just knocking it out of the ballpark. It is not a small job. No, it's not. And I could tell when I interviewed him that that he is – it's 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 a serious responsibility, but man, is he just killing it? He and, is. You know, here's three words that they, they work on with the teenagers. They teach them how to think, they teach them how to dream, and they teach them how to lead. Perfect. That I mean, let's face it. Who who does not want their kids starting with a thinking process, dreaming what could be, and then actually going after and executing on it? Yep. And he talks more about that in the interview. It is good stuff. And then one of my faves from last year was. Christy Christie, and she's going to be back with us, mm-hmm. and uh, you're going to be talking to her about a trip to the Dominican Republic? Yeah, we had uh, kind of scheduled to get together, and we were going to tackle another topic, but she had just come back from a trip from the Dominican Republic, and it was so fresh on her mind, and I could tell God was still working that experience in her. She was still churning, if you would, that process. And in the small talk we had on uh, prior to recording the interview, I said, we need to just talk about this on air. Yeah. And that's what we did. We began to unpack that so that people could see and process how to deal with missions. How do we get involved? What does that look like to cast a vision for your students so that they are missions-minded? And uh, man, she she is a great spokesperson for Compassion International. And, and I'll give you an insight into this. This this blew me away. This came up in the interview, and I, I almost didn't know how to process this. And when we were, I was doing her bio, I uh, found out she and her husband, David, do not personally have kids. And we didn't really tackle any details of that. But she said that they have adopted four kids. I thought, wow. I mean, I've, I know people, you know, our, our, our life group has adopted two kids from Compassion. Uh, I, I know people who've adopted one, two, sometimes even three, but four, that's a pretty big number. And then she said this in the interview. She said, we intend, she said, her husband and I intend, we have a goal to adopt one from every country that Compassion's in. Oh, wow. And I said, how many countries are you currently in? And she said, 25. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So this is going to be quite an amazing interview. 
Cool. Well, then I don't see why we should do anything but just jump, jump in into this. So after the break, we'll be hearing from Jeffrey Wallace on how to help parents train their kids to be leaders. What if you could multiply your ministry 168 times over? We have a way for you to do that today. We believe that true discipleship is attained through diligently studying God's Word and applying the Scriptures to your daily life. Spending one hour each week out of 168 in a worship service is simply not enough. D6 Devotional Study Guides are here to help. Each week, everyone in your family studies the same theme, with lessons and devotions appropriate to each age level. Moms and dads will love the devotions and articles as conversation starters. Children will love reading and playing games in their own devotional study guide. Families will love spending time together during the week discussing and studying the scriptures. To learn more about the D6 devotional magazines, you can go to d6family.com slash d6 curriculum. It is Jeffrey Wallace time up in here. What up, what up, what up? Up in here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jeffrey Wallace is the man. He is an author, communicator, leadership coach. He serves as the executive, y'all, director <laughs> of the Lift Tour and the Youth Pastor Summit for Student Leadership University. I can't wait to talk more about that. Yes, sir. SLU is a national organization designed to develop and equip student leaders to think, dream, and lead. Yes, sir. All right, we're going to talk today. About that, How, okay. helping parents train to train their kids to be leaders. Yeah. This is a selfish interview for me. Yeah. I want my boys to be leaders. Right, So right. help me, help me, help me. Gotcha. All right. So you have a mission statement at SLU, and it says that you help students think, dream, and lead. Mm -hmm. We just talked about that. That feels like an awesome template yeah. for parents to use as well. So let's, let's just use that. Okay. So how do I get my kids to think? Well, I think the very first thing you got to do is you got you to gotta put them in intentional positions and environments where they get to stimulate their mind. So like, for example, at Student Leadership University, one of the things that we do, we have this thing called the 101. Uh, it's the 101 week. And in the 101 week, it is a leadership mechanism. It's almost like a business meeting for students. And so we'll put them in front of people like um, the CEO for Tyson's Food. We'll put them in front of Brad Lomanex, who used to run Catalyst. We'll put them in front of executives from Chick-fil-A or Pat Williams, who's the vice president President Orlando Magic, and we expose them to, you know, great thinkers and great leaders so they don't just hear about it, but they experience it. Then we put them in environments where we'll go to uh, SeaWorld. We'll give them a behind-the-scenes uh, look at SeaWorld, and we'll put them in the middle of a shark tank, and, uh, and we'll talk about the sharks in the water, and then we'll go to the dolphin show and talk about the DNA of a dolphin. So it's real-life experience to stimulate the mind. I think as parents, and I've been guilty as I have three boys, two in college that are still in my pocket, uh, and one that's a ninth grade. And, and I've been a parent who I've taught, 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 taught. This is a hyper-connected, hyper-visual uh, generation. So as parents, as we're parenting this generation, we have to put them in place where they can see ways to think, they can, or they can see ways to dream, they can see ways to lead. So it's, it's about the experience for them, the visual experience more so than it is about just saying, hey, I need you to be a great thinker. I need you to read this book or, or whatever. So that's what we try to do. Student Leadership University is really kind of partner with parents and come alongside them and say, hey, we want to help teach them how to process. We'll even do things like um, uh, how to do time management. We'll do a disc profile, personality assessment. We'll great. teach them about who they are, whether you are a D, an I, an S, or a C, you know, personality type, and what does that mean, and how do you interact with your parents. If you're a D personality and your parent is an I, what does that look like? So we really make it very um, experiential and uh, hands-on, and we allow them to see it visually. Yeah, and that's transferable to parents mm -hmm. as well. They could. There's plenty of places online where they could do personality-style tests yeah. to, uh, to, to do that with their child and say, hey, this is why our relationship is the way it is. You know, yeah. sometimes we think we're just 
being ornery, but really yeah. we, it's just who we are. And it, sometimes it matches, sometimes it doesn't. Yep. And I think it was is very helpful, especially when we've had parents that come to the 101 with their kid and they'll do the disc profile with them. It is that moment, Jeremy, when it's like, oh, that's why you get on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> you it. know, so it's real good. All right, so how do, if I want my boys to dream, I want them to dream, so how do I help them do that? Yeah, well, it's the same way. You got to put them and you got to put them around dreamers. You know, I think um, for for us as parents, one of the things that we always envision for our kids, we want them to be better than what we are. We want them to go further than where we've been. We want them to see themselves as winning. And so um, I think it's so important that we put our kids in the place of dreamers and we have to talk to them about you know being able to identify people who are going to be assets and liabilities because assets are dreamers liabilities are dream snatchers right oh and, come on you know and so i think it's important that you know we really just place them around people and so who is it that you want your kids to be be like and i think as parents you know, parenting this generation, we kind of got to go the extra mile now. I think that's what I've noticed. And so, for example, if you want your kid to be an engineer, okay, and I'll, I'll take my, my middle son, CJ. He's at Kennesaw State, and um, he, he is uh, studying to be an electrical engineer. So there is a friend of mine who works for Siemens Corporation there in Charlotte, North Carolina, and and um, he's doing some incredible stuff there at Siemens. He's a great executive. Um, and so what I did was I connected my son to him, right? And I wanted my son to be able to see what it is to work in Siemens, to, to really envision himself being there at Siemens. So it's kind of taking your kid and mentoring them, if you will. And we're talking about discipleship and, you know, and how we, we want to help them, you know, walk in their faith. But practically speaking, we got to put them in places where, you know, they can attach themselves to dreamers, help them process what would you do if you can do anything in the world for the glory of God and knew you couldn't fail. What would it be? You know, talk to them about that. And then once they begin to talk through that, they process through that, then you got to put them in places where they can stimulate that. So how do we give them chances to lead? Well, I think, you know, it's a, a couple of ways. One, practically, you know, you want to get your kids involved in something at school. I mean, I don't care if they're a part of the glee club, the chess club, the picking up the paper and the back of the gymnasium <laughs> club. You know, I think it's important that, you know, we don't settle for our kids just being students. I think it's important that you put your kids in places where they are interacting with unchurched kids as well as church kids. And and because what we do a lot of times as Christian parents, we, you know, and I'm not knocking, there's nothing wrong with it, but, you know, we want them to go just to Christian school or homeschool networks or mission trips or small groups and, you know, Sunday Bible study or whatever. And that's great, and I think we need to continue to do that because obviously, you know, when we talk about the whole D6 model, it is when the church and the family partners together. But I think it's important that we also understand that our kids at some point, they're going to be out outside of the bubble of the church. They're going to be outside of the bubble of our home. Do we know that they have the, the skills to be able to engage non-church kids? And so I think you got to push your kids to be involved in, in school. They have to be involved. They got to start a, a Bible study or a campus club or, you know, just do something. Work at the concession stand at the end of the, the, uh, the football game or the basketball game. But I think you teach them how to lead by making sure they're in positions where they are having to lead. Then, yeah, you continue to put them at, you know, environments that got to go on a mission trip or do different things like that. But I think it's important, man. We got to get our kids comfortable being around unchurched kids. Mm, so true. So what are some of the mistakes that I want to avoid when I'm pushing my kid to be a leader? You want to avoid pushing on your kid something that you want for yourself and what you want for them. You want to put them in a position where they can dream for themselves, where they can think for themselves, and they learn principles that we talked about on how to lead. But we got to make sure that you want to, you don't 
push your own agenda on them, right? Here is a quick example of that. So my oldest son, um, his name is Jeff, and uh, he is a rapper, right? So he's he's a mass communication major at Kennesaw State. He's a senior. He's an incredible kid. And he told me, he said, Dad, listen, the only reason I'm in college is because you said it's better to have and not need than need and not have when it comes to a college degree. But he's an artist, okay? And um, and so he wants to pursue music, which I think is great. And, uh, and so he asked me, he said, Dad, you know, when I'm doing this music thing, do I have to be like the next Lecrae? Does it have to be gospel rap? Now, my first inclination as a pastor is like it needs to be gospel rap, right? It needs to it needs to be Christian hip hop. It needs to be you know that. And uh, but I realized that if that was my response, then I've totally missed an opportunity to coach him up, to mentor him, to parent him, in the midst of him wrestling through the tensions of his faith. So I said, listen, I said, here's the deal I'll make with you. I said, I'm not going to tell you what genre you should be. All I'm going to say is you want to remember that you love Jesus, you gave your life to Jesus, and you want to make sure that you don't do anything that damages your witness. And I said, I'm going to let you decide what that looks like. So as he went through the process, and he's gone through the process throughout high school and even throughout college, he's been very successful with it, and um, and he's had some bumps in the road. But because I did not just kind of slam down and say, hey, you have to do Christian rap, I left the door open for us to have dialogue. We have more conversations about his lyrics, what he should do, where he should go, what he, who he should collaborate with, because... As a, as a parent, you know, sometimes we just, we push on our kids. Yeah, ultimately, man, I'm going to tell you, Jeremy, I want my kids to love Jesus and to make him known to everybody they come in contact with. But I need their faith to be their own. Their faith can't be, they can't, their, their faith can't be from their dad, right? They got to find it, you know, um, on their own. And so I have to commit to being a mentor with my kids for the long haul. He's 21, and I understand that as a parent, it's a marathon and not a sprint. So he's going to have some ups and downs. And and so I think one of the, the the biggest mistakes we make is, one, we try to push our own agenda on our kids. You know, we got to balance that out. Um, and then, two, we want our kids to change and be hard for Jesus, you know, just like that. And every kid is different. I'm a baby boy. He... I mean, he's going to be the next missionary. He's going to be like the next Billy Graham. Like, he is sold out for Jesus right now. But my oldest, he's, he's not that kid. Well, I don't love him any less, and I try my very, very best not to highlight the fact that Cameron, my baby boy, you know, he's doing all these great things for the church. And, and Jay, my oldest son, is, you know, he's out doing this music thing. And so I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we make as parents is we, we put – our own expectations and, um, and and the things that we want for our kids, we put it on them and it's all this pressure and what it does is counterproductive. I've seen a lot of times where kids, where they, they go in and they hide, they don't want to talk to you, there is no real relationships because they're like, I can't talk to my dad because he won't, he won't understand because all he wants me to do is just love Jesus, love Jesus, love Jesus, and he wants it his way, mm. you know, so... All right, so before you answer. go, you are teaching a seminar called The Modern Family. I am. Uh, and where you're helping us figure out how to connect with all this stuff, foster families, blended yeah. families, single parent household, on and on. Can you give us a few of the tips that you're sharing in the seminar to connect with the modern family? Because yeah. it's not like it used to be. Right. Well, I think that's the first thing we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to break down the myths. We're going to talk about how, you know, we used to minister in family ministry to traditional families. Um, but now, as we've seen over the last, I really would say five years, uh, there's been just an, um, a shift in what the traditional family looks like. And so we're going to kind of, you know, identify what are some of the, the breakdowns of these particular families. Like what are the, the, the dynamics of, you know, families and foster care and blended families and, and all of that. And then we're going we're gonna to also walk through systematically how do you minister to them, understanding that no longer can we have this one-size-fit-all one cookie cutter type approach to ministry. We have to develop multiple on ramps in our family ministry in order to engage uh, these particular families. And so we're going to kind of talk about what are some on ramps, what are some options, what are some approach, some approaches that we can take, some strategies uh, that's going to look different. So what that means is it's going to cause, and I'm just going to tell everybody who comes to the, the workshop, I'm going to stretch you because it's going to cause you to have to think, you know, from multiple layers, right? And 
so that means that you may have um, um, multiple types of leaders in your your family ministry structure so that they can engage you know these particular families mm -hmm. so so we're going to talk about how it's it's not a one size fit all type of ministry but it's um it's a it's a both and not an either or love it yeah okay now look this is real important, I think, for the youth ministers listening. You do a, a conference with SLU that's yes. basically free for youth ministers. It is. It is. Yes. Tell them about it. Well, yeah. You know, well, first, I have a philosophy that if it's free, it's for me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So we have a conference called Youth Pastor Summit. And uh, Youth Pastor Summit basically is a free gift that we offer to any youth pastor, youth leader, educator, um, or influencer of, of uh, teenagers. And um, it's about the equivalent of a $300 gift. We do it in Orlando. We do it in Nashville, Tennessee. Dallas, Texas, here in Dallas, and uh, we'll do it in Southern California, and all you have to do is register. Now, I'm going to tell you, most people like to come to the one in Orlando uh, because we have our first day at Heart Rock Live in Universal Studios. We work real hard, and then um, probably midway in between day one, we give out 2,200 tickets to Universal Studios. Oh, yeah, and so uh, so people like to come there, but it's great. So we'll have plenary sessions where we have great leaders and, and, and uh, communicators like Bob Goff who will come and share during um, plenary sessions. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have, on day two, we'll have more plenary sessions, but we'll also have labs. And our labs are breakout sessions. And in our breakout session, we break them up in six buckets that I think every youth pastor, youth leader needs to know or learn about or hear about. First is we'll do leadership development. We'll do number two is programming, kind of like the what the uh, the nuts and bolts of programming. We'll do uh, volunteer recruitment and retention. Trending topics and culture is number four. You know what's happening in the world. We'll talk about worldview, uh, helping them understand their worldview, and then we'll do mission and outreach. And so those are the buckets. So you know you just get yourself there, you and your team, and we'll take care of the rest. And so uh, it's an incredible. You're talking like you're the boss of this thing. Well, you know we're we we we're all together in this as a team. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Hey, if you guys want to hear more about that event and catch up with Jeffrey, the best way to do it is to go to SLU Lead. Dot com, man. Thanks That's for it. being with us. Man, Appreciate you. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate you. We, we did. did we, yeah. <laughs> See Splink is a simple way to help families in your church link together spiritually. It comes as a free weekly email with ideas that parents can use to have fun, make memories, and talk with their kids. Those teachable moments give moms and dads opportunity to share spiritual truths and life lessons. And no matter how busy life is, there's always time to splink. Share d6family.com with the parents in your ministry so they can sign up today to start receiving free weekly splink. All right, thank you, my man, Jeffrey Wallace, as usual. Out of the park, my brother. Thank you so much for your time. I, let me add something to this, and, and I, I kind of feel that I served in the military, and I heard various people through the through the course of time say, oh, I think every young person should have to spend time in the military. And I'm not a fan of compulsory military, meaning forcing people into that, but I am a fan of every young person should go through a student leadership university of some type. And Jeff's is as good as you're going to find out there. Uh, there are many others out there. I know Randall House offers one as well. There's one that I've sent my kids to beyond even the one. But you need to get your kids through this. That is an absolute mandate. You will not regret it. Even if you have to forego you know, a trip or a long weekend or a vacation, it is an investment you will never regret. And the Youth Pastor Summit that he does mm -hmm. is, I mean, free? Oh, yeah. Let's go yeah. there. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. Uh, so the things that he does there are, uh, and their organization does is well worth your time time and attention. So thank you so much, Jeffrey. Really appreciate you. Uh, and we also appreciate Christy Christy. So let's just jump in and listen. Uh, Ron did an amazing job of setting this up. So let's just go ahead and jump right into the interview with Christy Christy discussing her recent trip to the Dominican Republic. I want to welcome to the D6 podcast, Christy Christy. She has spoken for us at D6. She speaks and writes for audiences around the world on how to have an authentic relationship and how to cultivate empathy 
in a modern culture that doesn't always do so. She serves on the Compassion International speaker team, and she dedicates her life to creating vibrant children's and family ministry resources and communities. She loves coaching leaders and maximizing their gifts, bringing renewal and excellence to those they serve. She and her husband, David, while they do not currently have their own biological kids, they have adopted four Compassion kids. And let me throw this challenge out to you before she speaks. She told me off the air that her and her husband have a goal to adopt one child in every country that Compassion serves, which currently is 25 countries. Throw down that challenge, Christy Christie. Wow, unbelievable. Where are your four kids? What countries are they in currently? Rwanda, Dominican Republic, uh, Haiti, and Mexico. Mexico. Now, Christy, yeah. you, t- you were telling me that you just got back from the Dominican Republic. And this is just really fresh on your mind. You got a chance to be with one of your own kids that you and your husband have adopted. Tell us about that experience and tell us about what you saw in the Dominican Republic there. Yeah, we were. I was down there for seven days with um, some of the speakers on the Compassion Speaker team, and um, it was pretty amazing. We got to um, travel to two different child centers that Compassion works in, and then on the last day, I got to meet Juan Carlos, who's six years old, who walked down the street, drove five hours to actually come meet me on his birthday. Oh, my word. <laughs> I know. I was weeping the night before. Wow. Just about what that all meant, you know, and... He came running towards me and wrapped his arms around me and just held on. And I just, it was life-changing, a life-changing moment where you realize what seems small and sometimes even detached or distant as a compassion sponsor, you think, you know, I don't really know this child. I get his colored pictures and his letters, realized not only are those colored pictures real from the child's heart, but he feels a deep connection to us. So that connection grew in me as well. How old is Juan? He's six. Six. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And he's all six. He just wanted to play with balls and run around. And I let him do that. We just played and we colored together. We had so much fun. He was just, and his mom came with him. She's 25, has three kids. Wow. And, uh, and a lot of burden on her um, life. And so it was exciting to think that like we're lifting a burden by investing in Juan Carlos's life. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. Kudos cool. to you and David. That's awesome. Oh, no, it's, it's our honor. So really tell, awesome. tell me what, what's, uh, what's ministry like down there in the Dominican Republic? What did you see? Yeah. You know, what blew me away is these tiny little buildings are functioning and managing as many kids as most of our biggest mega churches in America do. So that really opened my eyes. We asked one pastor, how many kids filter through this um, child center in a week. And he said, um, he looked up and kind of started counting. And then he said, 479 kids every week. And they know their name. They know their stories. They're with them. And there's about seven staff people working with wow. them. <laughs> it just blew me away. Just amazing, deep work happening for children of all ages. And um, we saw programming for moms and babies for preschoolers, for elementary age kids. And then on, we have a leadership program for 12 through 9, 12 through 20 year olds, really helping them bridge into a successful life, lifting them out of poverty. So I'm just, I'm just blown away, but just really was struck by, you know, working in, in modern churches, really thinking we have to have these really perfected spaces and programming and entertainment. And maybe we do to engage an American child. But it did strike me that maybe not as much as we think sometimes, you know, because they're doing a lot with a little. So, so you're already processing and analyzing and applying. I have bumped into people who have done maybe not their first mission trip, but maybe their first mission trip to more of a second or third world country. And they see items they can't unsee. They experience events they can't unexperience. And when they get home and they look at the amount of excess that we have here in America, they look at our culture, they're wrecked. I mean, they don't know how to process this very well. How do you advise people to handle processing this in a way that can be applied to healthy, um, 
healthy unpacking on the other end of a trip like this? Yeah, that's really good. I think it's important to understand that we live in a really different context. And I don't think guilt or shame is really helpful for any of us as we process these kinds of experiences. But it does kind of bring me back down to earth. And so I think that's a really healthy thing. I think the question that uh, has kind of been posed to me through the Step Into My Shoes curriculum that we've worked with, um, I was using it to teach with it. And it's really actually impacted my heart the most, I think. (laughs) Um, but what is enough? And that I define my own enough, you define your enough, and they define their enough, people in the developing world. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what's, what's easier coming back from these kind of trips is that I actually saw such hope, you know, like there's really unbelievable work happening through these compassion churches. So I felt like I have an actionable path as a sponsor to really participate in the restoration of these communities. So that didn't feel like there's this hopeless, oh gosh, it's so sad, it's so empty. But sitting in houses where there, you know, there's like barely anything in the space, it's a small space, you know, like five or six people sleep in here. Um, it does definitely inspire gratitude. And I think, um, I think, yeah, the question of like, how much do I really need to buy? And we're living in a culture that always tells us that you'll be content once you have a little more. And that's counter to what Jesus has said and what Paul has said in epistles to say, um, be content in every circumstance. And so I think that seeing the contentment of the poor inspires my contentment, but also I hope that I can spread that around more by living more simply. So how does a student pastor or children's pastor or a parent teach that to the kids? How does a parent tell, t- express what's enough in, a, in their homes or student pastor to their kids so that they don't always compare themselves to their peers for that barometer of how much is enough? You know, it's a great question. I worked in Malibu for eight years. And I'll tell you what, if I had compared up all the time and looked at my life against somebody that had more, um, I would have been, I would have felt poor all along. So I think it's always important not to compare up, but to sort of look what we have. For a children's pastor or a student pastor, I think um, I think we can we can make sure that we're not always sending kids home from church with something they get at church, but including them in like a participatory process of like we're coming here to contribute, to worship, to worship God. And even to do service projects and and art projects that are collaborative, I really think collaborative is the answer. And for parents, I think, you know, the more I study the decline of empathy and how we, how um, entitlements connected to that, it is so important that we not say yes to everything. We just can't say yes to everything a child wants. That's not the road to happiness. It just isn't. And it actually leads kids down a path where they think they deserve these things. And when they don't get them in adulthood, they feel like they're not, they're not loved. They're not valuable. So may, may love not be contingent on getting stuff, you mm. know? Mm. I know entitlement's a big deal. You and I have had this conversation before. You've, you've dived pretty deep into that. Talk now, instead of to a parent how to teach that to their kids, Talk to the parents how to model that. I, I know it's some of the same language, but let's face it, we as kids aspire to what our parents act, say, and do. So we've got two minutes left. Talk to the parents here who are listening. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting how we can constantly point at the next generation and kind of go, wow, it's really, really doom and gloom. Look at them. They're so greedy. They're so self centered. The reality is they're often a mirror for our own behavior. So it's making sure that we're treating others with great respect. Um, I think even the way we talk about people in media, the way we, how much we allow that to fill our space will, um, will impact how they see other people. And I think the goal is not to dehumanize people and it's also not to um, need things to fill a void. So be careful to ask the question often and to model how you save for something. I think it's really important, the de- delayed gratification, um, not just he needs a new bike, so we're getting him a new bike, but hey, your birthday is coming up, so do you want a new bike for your birthday? We're going to wait for that because that's a gift, but also showing that in our own lives, that we don't just go buy everything that we want or or even lust after other people's things to say, 
oh, wow, if I only had that Range Rover, things would be perfect. And it's mm. like, no, you're going to get that Range Rover. It's just a car. It's going to need an oil change. It's life, you know? Mm. So. Well said. Well said. Well, I'm going to challenge our listeners that uh, if you haven't, and I know for our life group, we've done this. Uh, many of our, our people individually have done this. Uh, Christy's modeled this for us. Go to Compassion.com. Scroll down through their their homepage, and you're going to immediately see pictures of some beautiful little boys and girls. And right beneath that, you're going to find that big yellow banner that says, Choose Me. And mm. one of the first things that you can do to model this for your kids is introduce a new kid into the home, the adopted kid that you're going to choose from Compassion International. So Compassion.com, go in there, make this a family event and begin to talk about how you can give and stop living an entitled life. That would be the place I would most begin. So I want to challenge our listeners. Christy, do you have any further words of challenge there? You've modeled this. I mean, you, you're, you're living this for us. Thank you. It's, it's, it's my honor. And honestly, I totally echo what you say. Um, and you get to not just sponsor a child, but have a relationship with them like I do with Juan Carlos. And you get to write letters back and forth, draw pictures. So it's really engaged. And that's what's different and cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for being a part of the podcast today. We so appreciate your ministry, your work, and how you've helped us process your experience in the Dominican Republic. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. Well, I, I hope you have stepped into her shoes. And in a sense, maybe you will consider the step into my shoes curriculum so that your students can see things in a very different view. And Going back and grabbing one more quote from there, can you define your own enough? I'll just let that one sink in. Thank you, Christy Christy, for uh, really helping us to open our eyes through a different paradigm on that one. And thank you for uh, letting us walk with you on your mission trip and what you see and how we can uh, better process that with you. Uh, next week. Well, Ron. Yes. Next week is episode 110. So we are 10% of the way to... Going episode. from 100 to 200. That's true. And you know what? I had to do math for a second to make sure I was saying that correctly. That's a pretty big deal. That we're is a big deal. We're already 110. We are. We're, so, already, we're planning episode 200 right say, now. What are we going to do for episode 200? We're planning it right now. <laughs> I'm not sure what we're going to do, but we've got paper in front of us. Maybe the Dominican Republic. Maybe so. Maybe, maybe the um, all-inclusive resort. Maybe we'll live broadcast there and have a tape delay when we get back to uh, to the States. <laughs> hey, we are going to have fun. We're not going to have that much fun next week, but we are going to have a good time on episode 110 with my man, Dan Lavalia. And Dan, I got your name right, finally. Dan Lavalia. That's right. Well, you can't say that normally, Ron. No. You're judging me with your look there. You're like, why are you speaking like that? But uh, it's my man, Dan, and he's going to be talking about the secret to serving frenzied families. I particularly mm. remember this interview. It was really, really good. You guys are going to enjoy it. And then we also have, sorry, Ron, I'm going to do you two interviews. I'm taking I'm, over. I'm just coming along for the ride, and I love it. Our second interview is with Pauline Dillard, and she's going to be talking about how to minister to new moms and dads, because that's what she does very, very well. Hey, guys, we'll see you all next week. Have a great week of ministry. Episode 110 is on the way. We look forward to it. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com. And if you're a minister, we invite you to join the D6 Leader Network by going to d6leader.net. 